I'm Jonathan Lehman. And I'm Mark Dever. And I'm Jamie Dunlop. <laughs> no, you're not. This is Nick Roark, the pastor of Franconia Baptist Church in Alexandria, Virginia. That's right. Not too far from Springfield. That's right. And welcome to another episode of Nine Marks Pastors Talk. I'm a little confused. If this is Pastors Talk, why isn't it just you and me? What's Nick doing here? We got a special guest. Because Nick wrote a book which she'll talk about as soon as I tell them what Nine Marks does. I thought Robert Klein wrote the book. Well, I'll get there. Okay. Nine Marks exists to equip church leaders with a biblical vision and practical resources like this book to build healthy churches. Learn more at ninemarks.org. This book written by Nick and Robert. That's right. Thanks for joining us, brother. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Kind of uh, goes well with the orange and the blue, maybe. Yeah. Well, maybe not. Maybe not. Uh, Robert now works as the, what's the official title? I wrote he helps it down. produce training materials. Managing Director for Training Content and Curriculum. Yeah at the IMB. Yeah. And the two of you guys conspired together to write this excellent book. Thank you for time, taking the time to do that. That's my joy. Uh, do you like stories? I do like stories. Is the Bible a story? It is. It is a story. It's one big story. It's got lots of little books and it, it culminates with Jesus Christ. And that's what this little book's about. Do you agree with that, Mark, that the Bible's a story? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to say that if people... Assume we mean from that it's not true. Uh-huh. But Nick loves to read fiction. But when he reads the Bible, he realizes he's reading history, a story that's true. Well, how is it helpful to recognize that what you're reading is a story as opposed to, say, a law book? or How does yeah. it participate in storiness? Right. So it helps because you get to see, as you said, God's history, the true history of the whole world, how it's unfolding and how he's bringing about his purposes in the world. And there's a beginning, right? There's a middle and there's an end. And so this story is moving somewhere and God's fulfilling all these promises in Christ. Now you say early in the book, you write, it's possible to read a story, find it interesting and entirely miss the point. Yeah. You know what that makes me think of? Makes me think of Mark, intern discussions. You know, when he quotes a guy out of context, Sure. he says something like, so you write here, Nick, that... uh, Nine Marks allegorizes, quote, allegorizes scripture. When, of course, what you wrote is Mark Dever does not allegorize scripture. Right. Is that like anti-biblical theology that Mark's doing? Right. I mean, biblical theology, basically, just as we can define it, it's, it's a way of carefully and prayerfully reading scripture and seeing how all of it relates to the person and work of Christ. So, so is it kind of sticking Jesus in every text? Is that kind of sermon? No, no, that, that, that goes back to the carefully. So it's, it's, it's reading scripture carefully and then zooming out and, and asking, how does this piece of the story uh, fit in with the whole story of the Bible? And so I remember when I, the first time when I read the Chronicles of Narnia, I, I read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and this was before I was a Christian hmm. uh, in elementary school. And I had heard a, uh, you know, a story about it, so I read the book. I read the whole series and didn't even realize as a non-Christian that Aslan was a, was a type of Christ. Mm. Right. And so I I missed, I had to go back and reread the whole series after I was saved to, to get the, the, the bigger ideas in it. Were you the only first grader reading the whole series of Chronicles of Narnia? (laughs) No, it was, it was later in elementary school. It wasn't first grade. Second. Third. It was like fourth or fifth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, for me, so for me, the connection point is actually the Star Wars series. Right. When you get to the end of the second movie and you realize that Darth Vader is Luke's father. Right. It makes you go back and read the first movie and the first part of the second movie differently. Sure. It's kind of like that. Yeah. Biblical theology. Yeah. So I think that uh, a, a place that we start out in the book and I think a, a helpful place, at least where I go for my people um, in our church, is to help them see when we when we read the scriptures and, and are connecting whatever we're reading in the Old Testament, New Testament to, to Jesus, we're actually reading the Bible the way Jesus instructed us to. Uh, the risen Christ in Luke 24, he's mm-hmm. walking with his disciples on the road to Emmaus. He, he, he tells them, he opens their eyes, he reveals himself to them. And then he says, you know, everything written about me, right, in the law and the prophets has been fulfilled and is being fulfilled. So uh, he points his disciples back to the Old Testament, to the law, the prophets, and the writings. And he says, there are all these things concerning himself that are written there uh, for us to discover and enjoy. 
Yeah, he, he can quote Psalm 110 and assume it's written about himself. Right. So he uses that as a, as a sort of parable or a little riddle to, to give to those he's talking with so that they can perhaps, in solving it, come to see who he is. Right. Yeah. So you're saying if a pastor reads, preaches a particular text and doesn't, not show how the text Jesus is hiding under the rock of that text, point right. directly to Jesus, but sure. he's, he's, he's not doing it in a way that understands where that text fits in the storyline that culminates in the person work of Christ. He's actually misteaching, misapplying that text. Yeah, I think that uh, a great place the pe- that we always go to, you know, to Second Timothy to see, you know, to see that all Scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable for us. But just right before that, you know, Paul's writing about those sacred writings that Timothy had grown up reading, and he says the Scriptures are there. They're, they're there to make us wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So we we don't want just to teach a passage and stop there. We want to make sure that we're we're taking our people faithfully, textually, and showing how that passage uh, relates to the gospel, relates to Christ. And if we don't do that, you know, you, you can end up just teaching something that that somebody in a in a in a different context would affirm. So but, let's say I'm preaching through the Ten Commandments, I'm doing a series for yeah. example on the Ten Commandments. Sure. And I get to the fifth commandment: "You shall honor your father and your mother." Sure. How is that fulfilled in Christ? Do I go directly to the Garden of Gethsemane, where the the son is honoring the father's will? I mean, what? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that uh, if you were teaching the Ten Commandments, yeah. right, and and if you were summarizing it, right, you know, Jesus gives that obviously that wonderful summary: the loving the Lord with mm-hmm. our heart, soul, mind, and strength, loving our neighbors, ourself. I mean, e- even later in Leviticus eighteen, right, do this and you shall what you'll live, live, right. Well, the the way that I, if I was teaching that passage, obviously saying, look, this is what God's called us to. This is what He requires of us, um, and the and the only one who's ever done this honored His Father. I'm sorry. The only one who's ever yeah. honored his father. Yeah, right. Who's 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 completely and fully obeyed this, right? He didn't actually live. Um, he died, you know, in our place to to absorb his father's wrath. Um, and and now he died our death so that we can live in him, right? So I I, I think it would be an, an, a natural way to connect it, right, to you know, Jesus's obedience, right, even to the point of death, death on a cross. The subtitle of your book. Can you explain that for us? Okay, so the title is Biblical Theology. Subtitle, How the Church Faithfully Teaches the Gospel. Can yeah. you explain that? Yeah, so we, both Robert and I, we share passion for teaching Christ and all the scriptures, and we also want pastors and church leaders to be able to teach the gospel faithfully to their people. And so um, we wrote this with a burden because we see errors, right, in the world where uh, that are produced because of a, a failure to seeing how the whole story of, of the Bible is about Christ. Um, we talk a lot about in the book about the prosperity gospel, mm-hmm. right? And if you think about taking those little verses out of context and, and teaching that the Bible's all about... The prayer of Jabez. Exactly. M- making making us healthy, wealthy, and happy now, right? Um, we see that as a perversion of the of the Bible. And it, and it also, it, it's, it's a result of not understanding how the whole Bible is about the So Lord. why... I, I mean, I've got shelves of books. Sure. Called Biblical Theology. Right. Why another one? Well, I imagine if we went and looked on your shelves, yeah. most of the of the excellent biblical theological resources that are out there um, are lengthy and somewhat technical. Mm-hmm. So I have a, several on my shelf. A lot of the good ones are 700 to 1,000 pages, right? And by God's grace, there's more short, brief, accessible Vaughan resources. Roberts, God's Big Picture. Exactly. And so what we're trying Graham to do Gold's in this... Graham Goldsworthy, Gospel and Kingdom. And th- this one is, we want this to be eminently readable, mm-hmm. simple, and clear that you can give to anybody in your church that maybe is unfamiliar with this uh, uh, concept. I, th- I think it is. I think you all did a good job with that. Do you, do you feel you met that goal of what you were trying to do? I hope so. That We, we were writing it with that in mind. We were thinking yeah. of people, even folks in other parts of the world, that maybe they don't have access to seminary or whatever. This is mm-hmm. intended to be a helpful uh, taste. And hopefully they'll read this book uh, and it'll, it'll encourage them to go back and just read their Bibles, yeah. right? Well, not, not only is it shorter and simpler than many of those volumes. And, I think and purple. It is very purple. It is purple. The Unlike your tie, which is orange. That's right. It, it's Tennessee it's Vols. That's it, what's it going is, on right there. It is orange. Yeah. Uh, unlike those other books, the other thing this book does is connect biblical theology and ecclesiology. It yeah. mm. you, you write at one point, biblical theology helps guard and guide the church. 
It guards the church from the deadly error of proclaiming a false gospel and guides the church toward keeping the proclamation of the true gospel as the centerpiece of its mission to the world for the praise of God's glory. So biblical theology is not just a seminarian's hermeneutical sport. Right. Right. It's it's actually how we, we grow and build healthy churches. And I think you make that connection clear. And I, in a way, I've not seen other books do. I, I think that's fair. Can you think of another book that... It may be there. It just, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't, I, nothing comes to mind. Yeah. So it, it, if we're not teaching the, the real gospel, right, then we're, we're teaching... By, by its definition, a false gospel that's going to lead to false converts and, a which false, is, church. and false churches. Yeah. yeah, and so yeah. So in the be- so in the beginning chapter chapter or the introduction of chapter one, you talk about how lack of biblical theology can lead to a prosperity gospel church. That's one brand. You talk about a civil gospel church, which uh, you know confuses church and nation. Can you right. explain that briefly? Yeah. So it would be it would be that you know uh, a church that. Talk, for instance, in America, a church that talks a lot about uh, God bless America, but is not is not teaching uh, um, the 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 true holy nation in God's eyes is the church, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you go back into those Old Testament texts. You look at promises exactly. given to King Solomon, sure. or Israel, and right. you, you apply them to America. Right. right? Uh, you have a third, a soup ch- uh, soup kitchen church, which emphasizes good deeds at the expense of making disciples. Yeah. Is, we, is that a property of bad biblical theology? Yeah, I think it. Accenting what you just said at the expense of. So of course we're called to be, you know, to do good deeds and to do works of mercy and and to seek that. But if if we are neglecting what's central, right, the proclamation mm-hmm. of the gospel, making disciples among all the nations, if that in any way uh, shifts our attention from from that to something like uh, some of the things that we mentioned in the book, then that's that's a problem. And then a fourth kind of church. Uh, I think this in the. I think Robert wrote this first chapter. Correct. Yes. Uh, the immorality affirming church, right? How is that a result of bad biblical theology? Right. So, so all all through the scriptures, we see um, God's you know promise of judgment uh, for unrepentant sin. Right. We see that, and 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 when you look at the the storyline of the scripture, we know that we're going to stand before a holy God and have to give an account. And so, if we diminish right uh, the reality of what's to come, right. Uh, then we're not we're not really teaching what the scriptures are, are saying. Right? So a, a church that says homosexuality is not wrong, right? And they affirm that as a, as a lifestyle. Yeah, I think in many ways, unfortunately, you're you're seeking maybe a short term applause of the world um, uh, at the expense of right. Um, well, or, or even you're God. seeking what you think is transparently just and right, yeah. because you don't think scripture teaches it's wrong, or you don't believe in scripture at all. Right. Yeah. yeah. So how does biblical theology change, uh, shape the church's mission? Well, again, to go back to Luke 24, uh, Jesus, in pointing back to the Old Testament, he not only says that the Bible is about the Messiah, right, the Old Testament, but he also says, you know, under the, under the, the, the words of it is written, right, he says that, that the Messiah, right, that the gospel is going to be proclaimed in his name, mm-hmm. the forgiveness of repentance sins are going to be proclaimed in his name, you know, to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. And so we see with the Great Commission um, how knowing how the story culminates in Christ, and He, you know, obviously the Spirit is outpoured at Pentecost, and we are sent into the world uh, to make disciples through the local church. Amen. And if I'm not understanding the story correctly, what's interesting, a lot of the people uh, advocating for a broader mission, and the church is kind of responsible to do all of this mm-hmm. stuff. Uh, they're they're working at their biblical theology. You know, I mean, Chris he, writes a great Wright example. Is, is doing he, he's he he was one of the I would say the earlier writers, at least in my generation, who in the 80s, by his commentaries, popular commentaries on the Old Testament, which were excellent, was kind of pushing forward this idea of uh, both a a biblical storyline, and he was popularizing it among pastors then, uh, and at the same time, he was seeing the, the focus of the gospel not quite as, what I would think is sharp and clearly focused on verbal proclamation as... I think it is in Scripture. He was seeing it as inclusive of more things, but he was doing a good job with a lot of the biblical theology. Well, and that's where I feel like a lot of those guys calling for a broader mission. I want to, you know, on the one hand, hey, that's great. I appreciate the emphasis and pushing others of us to do biblical theology. When you've actually just to... done one chapter in a book about this, you want to just give that reference quickly for people. Uh, what is the mission of the church? Uh, four views on the church's mission by Zondervan. And Chris, Chris Wright was one of the he writers. He wrote one, and I wrote another. 
and we had a good interchange in the book, but then also in person uh, enjoyed that. And so on the one hand, I want to say I'm, I'm grateful for f- folks like him who are pushing us to do biblical theology. But what, what that teaches is you got to keep working at it. Mm-hmm. You got you to get the story. It's not just about telling the story. It's about getting the story right. Mm-hmm. So I can have two daughters who come downstairs. They're mad at each other. <clears throat> okay, what happened? One daughter says her version of the story. Another daughter says her version of the story. They're different stories, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and I got to figure out, okay, which, which is the better story here? You know, I think one of the early, time, early times that I was exposed to biblical theology was probably about 1979 in a theology course at Duke University taught by Robert Osborne, who was a systematic theology prof, I think United Methodist. And he had us read a bunch of liberationists. And uh, I remember reading Exodus, the story of the Exodus, and seeing it in a larger panel of history than I, at that point, as a young Christian, thought of it. And yet for him, or for Gutierrez and the liberationists we were reading, it was part of a story of political liberation. So they, they had the kind of larger story idea, which was good and correct, mm-hmm. as opposed to some of the microscopic things that are done that dwell down deep in maybe a word, but don't really get the point of what's going on in the book of Exodus. But yet they were just kind of off or, you know, the great theological classic Prince of Egypt that Disney did, you know, where once again, the point seems to be a kind of political liberation, establishing a state. Moses is George Washington. And uh, it's just it, it it's just missing it. The glory of God is what it's about. Right. So you, you have to get God's centrality right in order to get the story right. And that's why I think you and Robert, it's one of the things you and Robert do a good job of. Yeah. Well, it's funny when you mention Exodus, because I just I would say I discovered biblical theology in some ways, articulately reading Graham Goldsworthy in ni- mm-hmm. the 90s. But in some ways, Mark, more than that, it was you preaching Exodus. Mm. You did two sermons, one on 1 to 18, 18 yeah. and then one on 19 to 40. And it was that God as central emphasis. Mm-hmm. I remember being bowled over. This it's exciting, isn't it, when you see it? 97, 98 yeah. or something yeah. in there. Something else helpful about the book, brother, is is it's practical. So you, you tell the story. Mm. You take a couple of chapters to tell the story, but then you offer little preaching tips along the way. So is when you're when you when you're talking now, about how much of that did he write and Robert and how much of it did you write? This is him. Well, but you're the nine marks editor. This is did you write the the, the preaching tips? I wrote those. I yeah. thought you claim that you always write the nine marks books. No, just 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 some of yours. Oh my goodness, <laughs> Nick, you get um, more respect than I do. Uh, preaching tip: you're, you're you're talking about the story from Exodus, and you write, for instance, the Exodus of Israel from bondage in Egypt points forward to a greater. Exodus of Christ's people through the cross of Christ, Colossians 1, 12 to 14. The Passover lamb points forward to the perfect spotless lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John 1, 29. So you're helping the reader be like, okay, this is an example of how I make some of these connections as mm-hmm. you're telling yeah. this story. One practical tip for preachers, I always say, is when you find an Old Testament verse fulfilled in the New Testament, points to in the New Testament, Write that clearly in your Old Testament. Yes. Because you can easily find in the New Testament study notes that will tell you where they're quoting from the Old Testament. But for some reason, study Bibles just don't as much. Maybe if I keep saying this in public, they will, you know, write down in the Old Testament where in the New Testament this scripture is fulfilled or explained or used. We say this, uh, we say this in the book, and I, 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 I stress this so much when I'm talking to our congregation about this. But so much of the work of biblical theology has already been done for us by in the New Testament. By, yeah, in the New Testament, yeah. but even in our Bibles with just our cross references. Yeah. Like if so many times we don't look up those quotations yeah. or allusions or echoes or whatever, we or, don't take or the, the time Psalms to do will it. use Exodus, sure. you know, even inside the Old Testament and, that's happening. And so if we really believe that Scripture interprets Scripture, um, that can be our guide to helping making those connections for our people. In another one of these preaching tips, this is the one from Genesis 3. Uh, it is easy to preach a sermon from Genesis 3 and make it about all about resisting temptation. Adam was tempted and failed. How can we face temptation and not fa- uh, fail like Adam did? And you say, this is moralistic pre- uh, preaching. Like saying, Adam was bad. Don't be like Adam. Very Pelagian. Right. The truth, according to Romans 5, is that we did, in fact, fall in Adam. He was our covenantal representative, and he failed, and we are guilty in him. We need a faithful Adam, one who is attempted and proves to be a faithful son. That faithful son, of course, is Jesus. So I just love that little thing. A guy's preaching Genesis 3. He's going to stumble into that air. You're like, mm, careful. Yeah. 
and the other thing that occurs to me is uh, uh, Robert Klein was part of the project to help give an international perspective sure. to the whole thing. Uh, and then I noticed you have recommendations from pastors in Brazil, Puerto Rico, United Arab Emirates, uh, all over the place. So are you hoping that this is used not just in American context, but internationally? Yeah. So w when we when we first started talking about this and planning it, that was our that was one of our main hopes is that we really want to help serve leaders and pastors uh, in in a, in other contexts outside of North America that 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 maybe don't have all of the resources, uh, biblical theological resources that we have access to here and training here. And so we, we would love for this to be helpful um, uh, to pastors, especially, uh, like I said before, especially in, in, in areas where there's just rampant uh Well, you think of prosperity teaching. gospel around the world, for yeah, instance. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I love the way you're so clearly centered on Christ throughout this. You talk about biblical theology being a map, mm -hmm. a glorious map. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing that gets you through is the story of Christ. Right. Um, and you say at one point, you quote Colossians 1.17, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And then you say, Christ himself, the promised king, is the one who holds everything together, including the grand story of Scripture itself. The Old Testament points forward and prepares the way, as it were, for the coming of the king. The New Testament proclaims the arrival of the king and his mission to all nations. Biblical theology, therefore, ends with King Jesus and the fulfillment of his promises to rescue and redeem for himself a people for his praise. Yeah. I just thought that's a great perspective that you and Robert do a good job keeping throughout the whole of the very brief book. Yeah, we wanted it to be brief so people would read it. You have a chapter called Biblical Theology and Teaching, and you lay out five interpreted lenses. Context. Yeah, so just that? carefully reading the passage in its context, both textual context and historical context. Like that chapter exactly. there. And that the, what does book. this paragraph mean in this chapter and in this book? Yeah. Okay, context, covenant. Right, so understanding the covenants are kind of the steel girders that carry the weight of the biblical story. So where does this passage fall and how, how does it relate to uh, the, the major covenants that we find in the Bible? Context, covenants, canon. Right, so once we understand its relation to the, to the covenants and what it means in context, we want to understand, okay, what are those canonical connections? What what are connections? Perhaps N New Testament does the mm -hmm. New Testament quote it? Does does the Old Testament you know allude to it? So making those cross canon connections, context, covenant, canon, character of God. Right. So in a, a lot of times, uh, really in any passage that relates to God, we can you know meditate and draw out you know how is His character revealed here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Context, covenant, canon, character of God. Christ. Christ. All, all C's, if you notice. Right? <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah. So, yeah, just asking, how does this text, if it's in the Old Testament, how does it point forward to the coming of Christ? Um, how does it prepare for the coming of Christ? Um, and if it's a New Testament text, if it's looking back to the to the arrival and to the work of Christ? Yeah. I, th I think it's uh, what's helpful about giving all five of those and giving us a, a very clear roadmap and... Uh, some tools is it's easy for biblical theology to feel sloppy and irresponsible, sure. right? Ad so look, hoc. Yeah. What you ad say? hoc. Ad hoc, yeah. Random. So, you know, Moses was whisked away from a dangerous ruler. Right. Jesus was whisked away, you know, and just kind of making these connections. Right. Yeah, so so that, um, I was waiting for the question. So so that's, <laughs> we, we, ever, don't, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. No, that's right, we don't. Yeah, yeah so I think that uh, we want to make sure that our uh, biblical theology is fundamentally textual, that it's rooted in God's inspired word. And so one of the one of the best ways to do this is to lean on the biblical authors themselves, right? And so like Mark said earlier, we, we have so much of the New Testament authors pointing back to drawing our attention to texts. And then it's our, our responsibility as those who are filled with the Spirit, to make sure that we're understanding how they're quoting those passages, how they themselves are making those connections, and drawing out the riches of that uh, um, when we teach. How, how did you learn to do this? Was it a boyhood pastor? Was it John Salehammer at Southeastern? I mean, what? what? I think uh, definitely Dr. Salehammer was a huge influence. I think one thing I remember he, he asked us to do in one of the classes that we took with him was uh, we had to read the Pentateuch as many times as we could uh, in the semester, uh, just read it over and over again, the whole book, and uh, and then at the end write a really brief theology of the Pentateuch. Mm. I had never done that. I, mm. I, I'd read the the Pentateuch before, mm -hmm. but you know, in a Bible reading plan where I sort of read it, you know, over chapter two day. exactly. Yeah. So I think 
that that was something that I began to see connections there. And then you begin to see how the prophets are relating back to, to the Torah and then how the writings point, and, and it's just... It so sort of it, moves from there. It may be too obvious to say, but reading the Bible yeah. really helps you understand biblical theology. Yeah. So uh, reading it over, I mean, again, it's like Psalm 1. Becoming right? we, more familiar with exactly. it. Exactly. We, we, we can't make those connections mm-hmm. faithfully and textually if we're not uh, you know, meditating on God's Word day and night. And, and that just is going to happen over time, right? We just read it, continue and, to read and, it. And back to the arbitrary, you know, how do you make sure it's not arbitrary? I think reading it more and more... The, th- the connections you've made will either appear more arbitrary, like, oh, I just saw that similarity as I keep reading it. It's really not the same thing going on. Sure. Or it'll be more ingrained. It's like, wow, I mean, that is really what, what is going on here. Yeah. I mean, just like this happened, so now, the, you know, the exodus, then the exile. I mean, right. this is this is baked in in many different ways that we're to see yeah. the parallel of this, and both of these are pointing forward to the great deliverance in Christ. Right. That's well, I've got to find a point on it, not just reading it, but reading it and reflecting on it in, an, in its larger Context. So sure. I remember sitting in my Old Testament, you know, intro class or something, and, and the professor observing. Notice how Exodus begins with Moses' uh, birth, and Deuteronomy ends with his death, and realizing, okay, that the author is bookending those for us, mm. and and we're to see Moses' life, and then Genesis intro to that, we're to see that in a certain totality, and reflecting on, okay, what is what is happening? What's the significance of the Torah as a whole? Sure. And then, sure enough prophets reflecting back on it, prosecuting according to it. Right. And yeah, you st- start to see all the connections that are there in the text, sure. just waiting to be observed and reflected upon. As you begin to read the Bible more and more, you begin to see that the Bible is is full of the Bible, right? And you see the biblical writers quoting the Bible and referencing back to it. And so, yeah. Uh, one last useful tool to point out in the appendix or maybe it's just a book or list of recommendations at the very end. Sure. You have uh, further resources, which would be a good place for people to go and look. Everything from David Helm's awesome Big Picture Story Bible to Von Roberts' God, God's Big Picture, so very simple intro. And then you move along to, towards more technical stuff. So the last thing is Brian Rosner and T. Desmond Alexander's New Dictionary of Biblical Theology. So a, s- a bunch of just really useful things. My, my last question for you is, how do you teach your church these things? How do you educate your congregation in this? And, and I guess you use these recommended resources to do that. Well, I, we use those recommended resources. I, I would add one more. Uh, Crossway's come out with these new s- short studies in biblical theology. That's right. And, and they're, mm-hmm. Like they're, Tom Schreiner's on Covenant. Exactly. So they're, they're brief, but they're just, it's kind of one step up. Well, uh, what about that earlier set that Crossway came out with on um, promises made and promises kept? That, that's a good one. Yeah. So yeah. we basically just give promises made, promises kept to our people, here. and then um, they're good. Uh, I think it. Uh, I've been at my church for three years, and so I think uh, I'm hope by God's grace to just be each week that I'm teaching, modeling it for my people. Um, we have Sunday school class on this very topic on biblical theology. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I did that in a series of overview sermons that I preached here on every book in the Old Testament. What were those New called? Trying to pull those together. What were those we called? We published them later. Crossway actually published them. We were called promises made and promises kept. Yeah, and there really a lot good. of pastors today mm-hmm. find those really useful. They are fantastic. I mean, I gave pastor. a year of my life to those sermons. Yeah. Uh, really... did you, are you saying you wrote those? <laughs> no. Oh, my goodness. You know, I, you know, I oh can tell the story. Goodness. I wrote a few paragraphs. Oh, my goodness. Which paragraphs did I write? Do I you recall? No idea. In the Minor Prophets. I okay. wrote a paragraph or two okay. in all the Minor Prophets. And what, what book are we talking about? Promises Made. Oh. But you don't mention that one. I mean, have you found that a helpful book for you? Uh, I forgot about it. But it, it's really helpful, though, Mark. I really like it. No, that's fine. Yours is shorter. I mean, it's yeah, it's more. I understand. Well, three great books: promises made, promises <laughs> kept, and biblical theology. Oh yeah. For I insecure just, authors near you, that's right. We again. want you to. That's right. Take a look at all, all three, three of, of them. That's, that's right. right. Thanks for coming today. Thanks for having to me. talk. Did you have any other questions for Nick? Thank you for giving the time to do this. I know you're busy. Young family, new church. It was kind of you. Oh, it really? Take was. all the time to write this book. It was pastors. a joy. And and it's it, for those of you folks who are listening who don't know Nick, he uh, was a pastor here in the past, and uh, he's always had a, pa- a passion for biblical theology. He teaches God's word unusually well. That's true. And always very informed by the context of the rest of the Bible. So he's just an ideal person to work on this with Robert. So thank you, brother. Praise God.